Before we start this episode, I wanted to let you know that the example timeline we'll be going over is available as a free download. Kaylee was kind enough to offer this to us for free. There's no email required, no signing up for anything. It's completely free. So if you want to follow along and use this as a starting point to plan your own wedding timeline, click the link in the description to download it now. Well, hello, thank you so much for tuning in. My name's Josh with Josh Likens Visuals, and today I'm here with my friend Kaylee Kroll from Kaylee Kroll Photography. And we are going to be talking a lot about everything, wedding photography, timelines, logistics, all kinds of stuff. Um, and before we get started, just wanna say a quick thank you to Brightside Creative Collective in Buchanan, um, which is where we're filming today. So thank you Brightside for having us. So Kaylee, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, so I'm Kaylee Kroll. I'm with Kaylee Kroll Photography. I'm based out of Clarksburg, Bridgeport area. Um, and I specialize in photographing weddings, um, couples, and uh, I do have a soft spot for mamas and seniors. So, so I think that the first thing we're going to dive into is timelines, wedding day timelines, because that is a question that I know we get asked a lot. I know that you work with couples a lot on their timelines. Um, so what is kind of like the structure of a timeline that you usually go about setting up? So there are a lot of things to consider when um, building a timeline. And so when I start working with a couple, I make sure that I know what parts of their day they're going to include, whether that be a first look or no first look, um, if they're going to do first looks with other family members, and most importantly, when they're going to have their ceremony. And then I kind of build around their ceremony backwards and forwards, starting with a specific ceremony time is like pretty much the most important thing for me. Um, and then I build a timeline based off of how much coverage they have requested six, eight, 10 hours. And things that could be important would be like if they're planning on giving gifts to anybody um, and if they want sunset portraits, you know, you have to kind of work around what time the sunset is going to uh, happen on their wedding day since it's so different throughout the year. Um, so I think those are really the important things. And then um, getting ready, uh, pre-ceremony, ceremony, portraits, and then um, reception. I've heard that a good kind of rule of thumb to help you in planning your timeline is to start at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Maybe start with like how long you want your reception to run and kind of work backwards from there. Because yeah. a lot of times the ceremony is budgeted for like 30 minutes. Um, which sometimes they don't even run a full 30 minutes. Everyone is different. Like mm -hmm. some like Catholic weddings are way longer or some like more traditional like Baptist weddings are like 10 minutes long. So it really depends on what you want to do. Um, but I think a good rule of thumb is to start at how long you want your reception to run yeah. and work backwards from there. I agree. I think wanting to know like how much coverage you're looking for for your reception is is super important because you can say my reception's ending at 10 p.m., but really everything's over with before dinner. And then you you have like four hours of just Uncle Bob dancing and <laughs> there's, you know, there's only so much that you can capture when they're the same people dancing on the dance floor. Yeah. So um, I think that is a good rule of thumb. I kind of will create a reception timeline separately and then put that into a full day timeline. So I don't know if that's how everybody does it, but I found that timelines were one of the more difficult things um, in the planning process, uh, something that my couples were coming to me often about. Um, and after a while, I was like, I'm just going to include this in my packages. It's going to be something that is complimentary to my couples. Um, I have the experience doing it and uh, I know it works and I know it doesn't. <laughs> and um, I know how long it takes me to photograph the different parts of the day. So I think that that has been really valuable for my couples to to be able to have somebody who's experienced in creating those timelines and then managing when the timelines maybe don't work out how they're supposed to so budgeting more time at the beginning of the day is a good idea because yeah. i think a lot of people kind of underestimate how long it's going to take them to get ready especially if you have a bunch of bridesmaids and you have 
moms and you have flower girls and everybody, it usually takes quite a while, especially if you only have one or two um, hair and makeup artists there. So I would probably put more time than you think you need on the yes. beginning of the day by like an hour or two. Um, and because a lot of people will put more time at the reception. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, sometimes it's like the same folks out there dancing and everybody has been there all day. And so they're kind of eating and then packing up and heading out. Yeah. I would say if you want more of like a dance party type of deal, like still plan for that, but maybe have like an after party. Yes. For like your like close circle of friends and family to like go somewhere else or like have an additional hour like at the venue or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and that'll probably help you out a lot. That's something I've seen a lot of um, when planning this year's weddings. A lot of people are having a separate kind of after party, like um, old like cigar room type style um, after party for their close friends, the people that they know will dance, the people they know will, um, you know, be out on the dance floor having a good time, resulting in those good photos that you want of your reception. Um but a lot of the time, you know, you do see uh, older folks, folks with kids go home earlier in the evening. Like you said, they've been there kind of all day. And um, so a lot of people pack up and they head out after dinner and the important events. Definitely an emphasis on the beginning of the day is something that I think is overlooked a lot. You know, this whole thing is is one of those that you don't really think about. You're like, oh, it takes me five minutes to get into get dressed. Like it takes me five minutes to get dressed. But you don't think like what happens when you need to go to the bathroom after you've already put on your dress. Like that's something, you know, some people think about after they're already in their gown. Um, or if you only have one photographer and you want getting ready photos of both partners. Um, having that extra time to float back and forth is is going to be needed in the timeline. Um, something that I see often is the bride being finished with hair and makeup last. And that's something I recommend against. Like, you don't want the bride to be the last person to get their hair and makeup done. Because if if something does run over, if somebody is out of schedule, then that pushes the bride. Whereas if she was a little bit earlier in the, in the plan, um, we could still do things with her while everybody else is being finished. So just some logistical things to think about when um, planning out the morning, but it is always better to leave buffer room. I leave buffer room in every schedule that I plan, every single one, because more often than not, people are not where they're supposed to be when they need to be there. <laughs> so chasing people down and um, making sure they're where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be always takes more time than people anticipate. Yes, buffer room is definitely needed mm -hmm. for like everything. And I think too, uh, try not to like cram so much stuff into mm -hmm. the day. I know that there's a lot going on and you wanna make sure that you do a lot of stuff but you also want to be able to like enjoy mm -hmm. the day and not feel like you're just being rushed from one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. And so I would say narrow it down to like the essential things that you really, really want to do and not just something that you think you have to do or something that is like trendy or whatever that you think you should include. Um, narrow it down to how you're going to be able to spend the day the way that you want to spend it with the people that you want to spend it with. And I think you end up with more organic moments, more um, of those, you know, authentic photos that you want. Um, no wedding is going to look like the weddings that you see on Pinterest. They're on Pinterest because they're curated and um, you can want to style a wedding to look like what you've seen on Pinterest, but that's not your wedding. And you're going to want authentic moments with your your partner, or your parents or your grandparents. And you have to make sure that you leave that time so that you can relax, so that you can have those genuine, like organic moments happening where you're able to step away with your parents and give them a gift and experience that emotion with them. Like you don't want to pack so much into your day to where you're anxious, you're feeling like you're running on a tight schedule and you don't have time to experience that emotion. 
Mm -hmm. It's your wedding day. You want to have, you want to feel the things. You don't want to feel like, okay, now what's next? Like you want to feel the things as they're happening. Um, And I think that's something that social media has definitely created a a monster with (laughs) the, the, um, the, the feeling that you need to create a specific kind of day because it's trendy. Um, it's not your day if that's what you're following. Yeah, because it's not a production. It's mm-hmm. not a photo shoot. Like we're not there to yeah. direct you around. And we obviously want things to look the way that you want them to mm-hmm. look, but we're there to document what's yeah. going on. We're not there to direct what's going on. Yeah. And so we want you to have time to spend it with your friends, with your family, with your spouse. I mean, there's a lot of times where, um, say you don't do a first look and you end up not seeing your spouse for 80% of the day. You don't see them until the ceremony, which I'm not knocking, like not doing a first look. I love first look personally. I will always advocate for them, (laughs) but you don't want to not be able to spend your day with the one person that you're there to spend it with. That's true. That's another thing people don't think about is on, on your wedding day, you really don't, if you don't do a first look, you are really spending like 80% of the day apart. Um, you're only together for like five or six hours of the day. Because it does go by super fast. I know that's like the cliche thing, like it goes by in a blur, but it really does go by incredibly fast. Yeah, yeah. So having the time to slow down in between things, um, you know, have something I've seen recently in the past year is a lot of people are taking cocktail hour to just spend with their their significant other just you just got married and you are going straight to family portraits straight to wedding party or you know straight to the reception but like a lot of people now are taking cocktail hour to just enjoy with their their new spouse so um i think that that's something hopefully we're seeing a lot more of is like people just taking in the moments and slowing down and realizing the day is going to go by fast after the ceremony and um, to soak up every minute they can. Because it's a lot of emotions too. Like after the ceremony or before the ceremony, you're starting to feel like a little bit pregame jitters. You're yeah. getting kind of anxious. <laughs> and then after the ceremony, you're just like kind of crash a little bit. So you <laughs> need some time to decompress, mm-hmm. even if it's just for 10 minutes. Well, and you're about to be in front of, you know, however many guests you have, dancing you're about to be in front of them for your cake cutting for you know you're the star of the show and now all of your guests are there some of my couples are a little bit more on the shy side so being the center of attention is is nerve-wracking for them so having that moment just with their partner like after they're married just to take that in before the craziness of the reception happens is um really valuable to them i think one of our couples actually did that in was it last year yes leanne and jonathan yeah they took a few minutes during cocktail hour to just like eat dinner by themselves Mm -hmm. and i could tell they just felt like so much better afterwards yeah and you know with the so many different with so many different parts of the day happening around you just that's the time that they get to be by themselves. Like we weren't there, nobody else was there and it was just them. Cause you know, you, if you think about it, we are probably the people that they spend the most amount of time with on their wedding day, oh, their photo and video team. Um, I mean, hair and makeup's done after a certain point. Um, the planner, they aren't with them throughout the day, we are following them around. We are with them more than their partner is gonna be with them on their wedding day. And um, to have that time when we aren't even with them, I mean, that's so special. I mean, a lot of people take that for granted. A lot of people don't do that. And um, so I think having that time, it's just, (laughs) you can't beat it. I mean, in what, it's like 20 minutes out of your schedule, you just, sit down and have a snack <laughs> make sure you eat because once you get to dinner it's like unlikely that you're going to eat dinner so like you need to make sure that you're eating if you're going the whole day and not eating anything you're not going to feel very good <laughs> no. 
Yeah. You sh- and you've also paid for all that food. Like, I know. Please eat your dinner. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's one thing a lot of people don't think about as a past bride. I recall not even getting any of like the cookies that we had at my wedding. We had a cookie table and I didn't get any cookies. Like, <laughs> like it's something that you don't think about, but like you can, it just, doesn't happen. I I think I maybe took like three bites of my dinner because, you know, you want to talk, you want to socialize. And, um, that's something that, you know, you, that's that time, unless you're off taking photos or something during dinner, like that's your time to socialize. So, well, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I know you brought your wedding guide here that you give to your couples. Um, so it also has like a example timeline. It in does. There, right? Yeah. Can we take a look at that? Yeah, quick? absolutely. Um, so this and along with my timeline guide, I will send to my couples just as a guideline to follow when they're planning theirs. It's not going to be the same. The sunset is going to happen differently on every day. The weather, the time of year, the location of the venue is going to determine lighting. Probably the most important thing is to determine when the sun is going to set on your wedding day. When are you going to lose light? Because after you lose light, that's it. Um, And so I kind of look at that and plan where that's going to line with the ceremony. And what I see most is probably four, 4.30 PM ceremonies. Um, like you said, ceremony times vary. So usually I will allot 30 minutes just in case, um, it's like a 15, 20 minute ceremony. You know, I've had some ceremonies where they've forgotten the rings you know they have to run back and get the rings and that's okay it's a perfect photo opportunity because everybody can get out their phones and take a photo of the bride and groom um so you know you just want to leave a little bit of buffer room if you don't end up using all of that 30 minutes that's totally fine because then you can use that for portrait time you can use that for family portrait time um if it is a longer more religious ceremony then you know you have that conversation with your couple in advance anyways um and you can allot for an hour. Um, I've had some that are an hour and a half before. So really it just depends on like what, um, if it's going to be a religious ceremony or not. Um, if they're doing any unity ceremonies, uh, readings, that's all stuff that I kind of ask them when I'm, when I get their questionnaire. So, um, I determine if they're doing a first look, if they want to do, um, if they want to do family formals beforehand or if they want to do wedding party or if they want to do both. Um, sometimes I'll find that couples will do wedding party before, but they still want to save family photos for after. Just when people are there, if people haven't gotten there yet before the ceremony. Um, and even just taking care of wedding party portraits before and some couples portraits will free up a lot of time after the ceremony so they can enjoy cocktail hour with their guests um, or separately. (laughs) Um, So in this, I kind of, I structured this timeline in my wedding guide to include a first look. So not every wedding will have a first look. Um, Like you said, I, I'm a big advocate for first looks. I think that a lot of emotion happens during them that sometimes doesn't happen during the ceremony. And, um, I, I will always push for them, but I'm not going to be upset if a couple doesn't want to do one. So this is planned around a first look with a 7 PM sunset time and a 4 PM ceremony time. And so I kind of like work around those things leave buffer room. Um, but I, I kind of have an idea of how long it takes me to photograph each portion of the day. Um, and how much time you should allot. And then in my timeline guide that I sent to my couples separate from this, it outlines how many, um, minutes you should allot and you can build your timeline around that. I think that this is at least a really good starting point Mm -hmm. or like a template like obviously, like you said, it, it's very dependent on a lot of factors like yeah. where you are in the world, what time of year it is. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. But I think that this is a really good starting point to at yeah. least give you some sort of visual of like, OK, here's something that we can start with. Yeah. And like a 7 p.m. sunset time is like 
I would say probably like a May or it's August. Summer, yeah. Um, you're looking at like a 9 p.m. in June or July. Um, but in November, you're looking at like five, four, four or five. Or five yeah. yeah. But it's it's really tailored. Um, and that's why I offer the custom timeline curation for each of my couples because it's going to be tailored to their day. It's going to, every wedding looks different. So I think once you get the um, important information, the ceremony, when the reception's supposed to start, like when did you tell your guests that you were going to have dinner and factoring in your, t- your coverage time, um, fitting all of that into your timeline is going to create the timeline for you, kind of. I do leave an emphasis on the beginning of the day because you are gonna want detail photos. For the bridal details, the dress shoes, all of that stuff, I usually account for, I could do 30 to 60 minutes. So it depends on if that's important to my couple or not. If not, then I'll spend a little bit of time on it. Then like getting ready photos, Usually I can take getting ready photos in about 15 minutes, but your getting ready portion is a huge part of your day. And that needs to be accounted for, usually starting at seven or eight in the morning and going until like noon or one. Um, And then if you're gonna do a first look, making sure that you leave time before in between the getting ready to get into your dress and um, your suit or whatever attire you're wearing and having those moments with your parents or having those first looks or anything like that. So those are all things to take into account. For the getting ready part, what at what point are you usually like getting there? Because I've had some people in the past express some apprehension to like the getting ready part because they're like, well, I don't want to like not be dressed or not have any makeup on, uh, which we normally don't get there. You know, if you're starting getting ready at eight, we're not going to be there right at eight. Oh, no. Like we'll get there usually once you have at least some makeup on or you've gotten your hair done at some point. If this was based off of a 4 p.m. ceremony time, um, and a first look, I I would be arriving at 11.45. I start taking detail photos at 12, so maybe they're not in hair and makeup fully. Um, I have in here that I would do getting ready photos at 1.15. So I'm photographing the details, I'm photographing ceremony details, reception details, and um, their individual, like attire, shoes, rings, that kind of thing. Um, and then I'll jump into getting ready photos around one fifteen ish. And it's not a set thing. You know, you can be getting hair and makeup done near where I'm doing detail photos and something good happens. And I swing around and I get, you know, the picture, you get the video, that kind of thing. It's, it's kind of fluid, but you leave that buffer room in the schedule so you can have the fluidity. Getting into the dress around 145. So that time is like them hanging out together. I see very often the matching pajamas, the matching robes, um, having usually when they spend money on that stuff, they want photos. Yeah. So making sure that you have the time to get the getting ready photos and the photos of them popping champagne or in their PJs. And then, um, if you are a solo photographer for the day, if you don't have an assistant or a second photographer, you know, making sure that you have time to bounce back and forth between the two of them. So definitely around like 1145, I would arrive on a day like this. Um, and whether or not the details are important to them is like kind of how I would structure getting ready and when I'm arriving. Nine times out of 10, (laughs) they aren't gonna want photos of them without makeup or with their hair all slept on. And (laughs) so a lot of the time they're gonna want those to be kind of near the end of the getting ready portion, which is right before they get into their dress. And pro tip for getting ready, at least for the photo part, whenever you are about done like getting ready, it's always a good idea to kind of sit near a window if you have any, because it just makes it look so much prettier. Yes, yep. And that's like when you can, um, yeah, get those natural light portraits and um, you can put your earrings in or, you know, do your finishing touches right there. And, and a lot of the time venues now will have that natural lighting in their getting ready space, which is um, usually what the 
hair and makeup artists prefer <laughs> to sit near, but, um, you know, that is, that is definitely ideal for photo <laughs> and video for sure. So with this timeline, like just taking this one as an example, um, how many hours of coverage would you recommend for a timeline like this? I think about eight hours of coverage is solid. And in an eight hour day, I am, you know, confident with like a, a 150, 200 person wedding, um, shooting it myself. Um, and if they do a first look or not, I'm usually confident in an eight hour day, um, that that will be enough time for getting ready all the way through reception events. Um, if they want more coverage, like a 10 hour day is perfect for, um, if they want a little bit more detail coverage in the morning or more hanging out all the way to like a private dance. Um, usually, you know, it, it doesn't take long to photograph the individual portions. It's just the day and mapping out the day to fit a schedule is like what is really the hardest thing. Um, because once you think about it, it's like family photos, you can really photograph in, you know, 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how many combinations you have. Um, getting ready, getting you in the dress is going to, it's going to take me five minutes to photograph, but the process of getting in the dress is about 30 minutes. So it's, you know, allotting that time throughout the day is what's important. Not so much like how long it'll take me to photograph the portions or you to record the portions. It's, um, it's the buffer room really. At the end of the day, it comes down to the buffer room and um, just making sure that it flows smoothly. Um, yeah, I think it's always the setup to everything is what always takes the longest. <laughs> it's it always is. the setup. And and like we said, getting the people where they need to be when they're supposed to be there. Yep. Um, wrangling the kids, wrangling the ring bearers. <laughs> yep, because you'll see often that after the ceremony, everybody's so eager to go to cocktail hour and get their stuff set down at their tables that it's like, where did Aunt Teresa go? <laughs> yeah. We needed her for photos. <laughs> so um, it's, you know, find, having somebody to help um, that knows all the family members after the ceremony and getting them to have everybody in one spot. So we aren't like looking for your brother, looking for your sister-in-law when they need to be where they're supposed to be for family photos. Um, but I think eight hours of coverage is a pretty solid, it's usually what my couples book. Um, and it's, it's something that I feel like I feel as confident in covering a full wedding day, the extras, like the private dance or the grand exit, um, or, you know, spending more time getting ready in the morning. That's what will probably lead to a more 10 hour day. Or if you have multiple locations. That's a big thing to consider. Um, some people have different ceremony locations from reception and getting ready. So you're traveling multiple times throughout the day. And that's something you need to consider when you're planning your timeline. It takes time for your vendors to get their gear out of their car, get their gear set up. Um, and for, moving that whole big crowd of yeah, people I was from say one moving, place to the next. <laughs> making sure everybody gets from point A to point B Hurting can cats. take 30 minutes, <laughs> you know? And in the drive time too, it's, I usually account for like 15 minutes. If I'm going from one place to another, I account for the drive time and 15 extra minutes to get my gear unpacked and packed, packed into my car when I'm leaving and unpacked when I'm arriving to the new location. Um, so that's something you have to consider. A lot of vendors include, th their coverage is consecutive. So it includes that travel time. It, it's not, that travel time isn't extra. That travel time's included and that has to be considered. Um, so one location, eight hour day is pretty solid. <laughs> <laughs> pretty solid. Um, but you know, if you're a couple that's willing to run on a strict schedule back to back, I don't recommend it, but it's possible. Um, 
anything's really possible when it comes to your timeline. It's just you're going to have to give and take when you're packing so much into a day. And when it comes to timeline too, if there's something you don't like. It doesn't have to be in it there. It doesn't have to be in there. Yeah, it's all it's all about you and what you want your day to look like. So if, you know, the timeline, it can be changed. What I come up with or what your vendor team comes up with doesn't have to be what you like set as your day of if you don't like something tweak it change it yeah. tell them at any point even on like the day i mean i wouldn't probably change your ceremony time yeah too much. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not on not the day of but <laughs> but you can change other things right? yeah yeah it's your day like we are just there to kind of make things easier for you so in in creating the timeline that's just us trying to help you in the planning process. It doesn't have to be exactly as we lay it out. If you want to change something, change it. Don't just be like, oh, it's fine. Like, this is what we're going with now. Like, change it. If you don't like it, it's not gonna hurt my feelings. It's not gonna hurt your feelings. It's not gonna hurt anybody's feelings. It's your day. Make it your day. We are just there with a guideline to help. So Kaylee, we had a question from Instagram um, of tips from a videographer or photographer's point of view of how to make the wedding day run smoother. So what tips do we have for them? My main tip is to trust your team. That's uh, first and foremost, your team is going to be really what runs the day. Um, making sure that you have a team of professionals that work well with others <laughs> um, and, and, that you ultimately trust to run your day and having a team that you trust, um, a team that is professional in handling these kinds of situations, getting off schedule, being off schedule by an hour, having to make up that time, um, you know, having that team that you trust is going to really be a beneficial factor because they're going to have the experience to make up that time. I know a lot of the time when I have schedules that I've planned, you know, to a T and I think they're going to be solid if something happens and somebody's not where they're supposed to be, hair and makeup runs over and we have to adjust. That's something that like I have to communicate with you. I have to communicate with the planner and if we can't work well together and if, you know, the couple is nervous about um, how it's all going to work out, that makes their day like it makes them feel anxious. It makes their day less enjoyable. Um, and it just puts pressure on even more pressure on them um, because we're not getting along or, you know, like we can't figure out a solution to make up time, um, whether that be me just working more um, with somebody during family photos to um, make sure everybody's where they need to be, like stressing that importance, um, restructuring maybe a little bit in the reception timeline with the planner to be able to um, fit in sunset portraits at a different time or swapping speeches with cake cutting. And it's, it's all fluid. So having a team that you trust that works well um, with, you know, other vendors and that's professional and has the experience is going to make the biggest difference in having a smooth day. I would say that and obviously allowing enough time in your schedule for buffer room because things do take a lot more time than you may think that they do. Yeah, I would say leaving the buffer room is probably the biggest yeah. thing that you can do to help yourself have enough time between things and have enough time to not be like super stressing out about everything and be able to relax and actually enjoy mm -hmm. the day. I will say some people will plan like moments in their timeline down to like the specific minute. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's too specific. I think you can't, you can't say my first dance is going to be at 6.04 and then my parent dance is going to be at 6.04. Oh, eight. Like you can't be that specific because it's not going to be on time. I can, I can tell you right now. <laughs> I can tell you right now it's not going to be on time. I don't so. think I've ever seen one schedule 
that went exactly as planned. Uh -uh. It is always going to be off by something. Yep. And that's how it comes in to play with having that team that knows how to adjust, knows how to work under pressure, knows how to make those seamless changes to where it's not going to affect the bride and groom's day and make them anxious or um, concerned if they're going to be somewhere on time, like trusting that we got this. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've seen it. We know what works. We know what we can do. We know what we're capable of. And, um, will make it happen for them. So if your timeline is off by any amount of time, don't worry we about it. We got this. We got this. It's normal. <laughs> yeah, it is normal. It's very normal. Like you said, like I haven't seen one that's gone exactly on time every time. And I think at the end of the day also, your um your wedding's not going to happen without you. Yeah. Your moments aren't going to happen without you. So keeping that in mind too, it alleviates some of that pressure because I know a lot of couples are like, what are we going to do? We're running behind. We're running behind. They're not starting without you. They can't. <laughs> you can't so have a wedding without you. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Just breathe. <laughs> breathe and drink some water. <laughs> so one final question. Um, as a photographer, we shoot at a lot of different venues and sometimes we show up and we haven't ever even been there before. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes couples will express some concern about that, and that's totally understandable. Like if you've never been somewhere before, how can you know what it's like? Mm -hmm. um, so what is something that you kind of do um, to help alleviate that concern? I would show up earlier. Um, if I'm scheduled to be there at 11, I show up at 10. Um, and I use that additional time, um, not at the expense of my couple, but to familiarize myself with the venue inside out and what places we can utilize for family photos, wedding party, couples portraits, um, if they don't already have those specified in my questionnaire that I send them. I think that that's just going to be of value to myself. Um, I'm not gonna be scrambling during family photos to find where I can take photos in the best light or what looks visually appear appealing. Um, I'm not using that time. And I, I have a plan going into their coverage at 11. I have backup options if something were to happen and, you know, it, it rains during the ceremony and one spot gets muddy. I'm not going to take, you know, my couple and their family over to a muddy spot. So, you know, I have, a, it's only going to help me familiarize myself with the venue and provide my couple with better photos. So if it means showing up 45 minutes to an hour earlier, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Um, and I think it also comes down to hiring a professional from the couple standpoint, hiring a professional who has experience in um, different lighting situations and different um, kinds of venues. I mean, venues are popping up everywhere constantly. New styles, new places. Odds are we're going to be photographing in new venues. This year alone, I'm photographing in three or four, maybe five new venues. Um, but because I've photographed over a hundred weddings in different venues, different lighting situations and different weather conditions, I am familiar with what I could potentially experience at those venues. The only thing I don't know going into those days is the layout of the venue and that I can find out when I arrive early. Um, so that's my advice. <laughs> and if that's a concern of the couple, um, you know, Hi, again, hiring a vendor that you trust um, and feel comfortable enough to have that conversation with is really important. I don't ever want any of my couples to feel like they can't come to me with a concern or come to me with a question that they have. Um, if they're worried about me photographing, um, say their ceremony got switched to an inside ceremony when it was going to be outside. If they're concerned about me photographing in a new space that wasn't planned, I want them to feel comfortable enough to come to me and talk to me about that. Um, because, you know, what's going to happen is I'm just going to be able to reassure them that like I have photographed in similar situations and I will be there early to take a look at the lighting. Um, 
and that they've got that I've got it covered. Um, so it's all about having that line of communication too. And I think that really any seasoned professional will tell you that we've seen it all. We've seen yeah. <laughs> terrible weather. We've seen indoors. We've seen outdoors. I've seen the power go out at the I, venue for the entire day. Yep. I've seen it, you know, pour the rain. I've seen it be a hundred degrees. I've seen the power go out and it pour rain <laughs> on the same day. Candle lit venue because there's no power whatsoever. No backup generator. Like I've been in it. I photographed at night. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and they turn out great. Yeah. They turn out great. It's it's all about, you know, that seasoned professional will tell you that we've seen it all. And if we haven't, we will go to the lengths for our couples. We will. We will go and, you know, do whatever we need to to, you know, provide them with the same quality that we promise them when they book us. Yeah. And I think too, if you as the couple are enjoying the day, even if something goes like completely wrong, like say the power goes out, if you're still having a good time, then your pictures are still gonna show that. Oh yeah. Because the pictures are about the day. The day is not about the pictures. So if you're still having a good time, if you're still enjoying yourself, if you end up married at the end of the day, that <laughs> is all that matters. <laughs> that is the most important thing that you're, you know, getting married that day, you're with your loved ones, you're with the people that matter most to you in the world. And, um, you know, it, it could blizzard, it could, the power could go out and we have a thunderstorm that prevents dinner from happening on time. But at the end of the day, like, what matters most is that you're surrounded by your loved ones. And yeah, if you have a good time, then it's the day isn't about the pictures. I think that we have covered quite a few things. Hopefully you got some value out of all this information. <laughs> Hopefully it was uh, entertaining <laughs> for you, <laughs> if nothing else. Yes. But uh, yeah, Kaylee, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me.